Hey everybody, I'm Quentin Schauer. Um, I play fourth trumpet in the UM Jazz Ensemble One, as well as study music education at the University of Montana. Um, today I'm just going to talk to you guys about some cool equipment stuff that we get to use in jazz, as well as later on talk about articulation and style, which is also a really important concept in jazz. So The first thing that I want to talk about um, are instruments. So this is the B-flat trumpet. So this is the most common. This is our home base for jazz. 99% of players use this on an everyday basis, so it's very, very common. The second one is still pretty common, but not as much, but it's the B-flat flugelhorn, which unlike the trumpet is a conical bore instrument. Um, so it's a lot softer and has a rounder sound and less pointed than the trumpet. Um, the third instrument is much less common. It's the B-flat cornet. So this is most often seen in small group settings and combo work, not a big band setting. So the next thing we're gonna talk about are the mutes that we get to use on a daily basis. So here's the first one, it's a straight mute. So this gives you a really tinny pointed sound. Um, I also have a couple here that are made in different materials. So this one, the first one I just showed you is the all aluminum body model, which is gonna give you that really bright pointed sound. The second one is the brass bottom, which I find is um, a bit lighter, not as punchy, pointy. Um, and the last one is the um, copper bottom model, which I find is the darkest. Um, and I think a lot more suited to solo work as well as jazz. So I'll give you a couple quick sound bites of each one of these. So here's the all aluminum one. Okay, here's the brass bottom. And finally, the copper. The next mute I'm going to talk about is the cup mute. So this is a Dennis Wick, this is really common, you're gonna see this pretty much everywhere. Um, so this is the type of sound for, you're, you're gonna hear it all over for like the classic big band sound. Um, so I have two different mutes here. This one is a Dennis Wick, and this one is a Joe Rao. Um, the cool thing about the Joe Rao, as you can see, is it comes with removable felts so that you can adjust the sound based on um, the kind of sound that you would like depending on who you're playing with. So first I'll give you um, an example of the Dennis Wick. Okay, and here's the Joe Rao with all the felts out. So this is how I would use it if I was playing in a big, in a big band setting without any of them in there. Okay, so I'll show you what it sounds like now with the felts in. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is my favorite personally. It's the Harmon Mute. This particular model is called the Bubble Mute and it's made by Joe Rao. Um, this one also comes in um, two materials for this line. Um, the one I just showed you is the aluminum. This is the all copper body. This one's a lot heavier and a lot darker. I really like this one, but it's a lot heavier on the end of your bell, so you have to get used to it. So this, the cool thing about the Harmon mute, or in this case the bubble mute, is it covers kind of two sides of um, the sound spectrum. So um, here's the first one. This one is, this is called the stem. This is with the stem in. So that's kind of your like really corny sound 
Um, you hear that in a lot of like movie music. Um, so I'll show you this now with the stem out. And this actually is what I prefer to use it with. And it gives you a really cool, nice sound. <laughs> Okay, so this next one is one that's really common in big band. Um, it's the plunger mute. So this, you don't know, they don't normally look like this. Um, they're normally rubber. Um, <laughs> a lot of um, players use the joke, you can go grab one off of the end of a toilet plunger, and it's true, because that's exactly what it is. Um, so this one um, isn't quite going to give you that kind of sound, but it's pretty close, so I'll show you. Okay, so the last one I want to show you um, is the bucket mute. So again, this is a, a bit unconventional for what you'll normally see. This is the Joe Rao model bucket mute, and it comes in the all aluminum, the copper, but I don't have the brass with me. So the cool thing about this mute is you can take out the inside of the mute to customize the sound that you that you want as a player so that's really cool um, a lot of times you'll see with these mutes you'll see in old um, in a lot of older designs they clasp onto the bell um, stone line is a good example um, I don't have one of those with me but they they go on the, on the end of the bell so Joe Rao decided to redesign them to go inside the bell to avoid any sort of scratching and it gives you a really really nice dark cool sound hi my name's andrew kagerer I'm a senior music education student at the University of Montana and today I'm going to be teaching you a style of breathing that will not only help your trumpet players increase their range and vibrancy but also just better and healthier playing overall. Now this style of breath goes by a few names. There's the wedge breath, the yoga breath, and the three-part breath. Um, basically all it is is a way of breathing that not only effectively gets as much air into you as quickly as possible, but it also effectively sets up your body right away to be able to play anything you want with a nice big sound. Now, as the, one of the name implies, the three-part breath is three parts. So, here I will show you all three of them and then go into a little into depth into what each one really entails. Now one of the most important parts of the three-part yoga breath that I'm going to teach you right now is using this one word to help you breathe. Hawaii. You ever been there? Nice islands would be really nice right about now to be there. It's all cold over here in Montana. But each part of the word Hawaii, Hawaii, each corresponds to a different part of our breathing during this breath. So, first we want to think, huh, in. If you see from the side, rapid expansion right here. Now after that, the wa brings the air up into around your, your chest cavity. And you can see everything here lifts up, and then the final part, E, is way, way up here in the top of your lungs. And that just not brings the air all the way up to the top, but it also does another very important thing. When you go E, you'll notice everything below here pulls in and tightens. And that is one of the most important steps in getting that nice, big, fat, vibrant sound that all your trumpet players are going to want to play. So now, all together. Hawaii. 
and eventually you want to get it to where it becomes just a habit where you always play that way. So you see, not only was my sound nice and big and everything we would want a trumpet sound to be, I could also play for a pretty long time. Now, listen to me play this scale while just using a normal breath, either even from down here or up in the chest. Now you can hear in that, near the end of that scale, my sound wasn't as good and bright and vibrant as it was before, and I didn't have any air left over, and we never want to be completely out of air. Now with the wedge breath. Notice how much more air I had and how much bigger and fuller the sound is. Another thing that this breath can affect is your range. If you've been breathing in a pretty healthy way when you play the trumpet, maybe the wedge breath might not add many notes to your range, but what it will add is a sense of security and stability with those notes. Again, this first clip I'll play with just a normal everyday breath and I'll try and go just as high as I can play. Now you can hear I was able to get pretty high, but did it sound good? Mm, not really, it was weak, it was airy, there wasn't any body to the sound. Now the same thing with our new breath that we've just learned. And remember, Hawaii. Now, while that breath didn't really add any extra notes, they certainly packed more of a punch. If you get all your trumpet players to start breathing in this way all the time, whether you're playing or no matter what, you're going to have a big sound, you're going to be able to play really loud, because we all know that's what trumpet playing is really about. And you'll be, and more, most importantly for your lead trumpet players, you'll be able to cut over the rest of your jazz band. And as a lead trumpet player, since you'll be dictating a lot of things for the entire ensemble, like style and articulation and even things like your swing feel and dynamics, it's super important to have everyone be able to hear you, even at really quiet dynamics. And one way to do that is to have a nice big full sound, even really quiet. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you guys found this information really helpful. Hi everyone, my name is Chris and I'd like to thank you for joining us today in the short video series provided by the University of Montana Jazz Program. Today I'm going to be joined by the University of Montana Jazz Ensemble One Trumpet Section and we're going to give you guys three tips to help your trumpet section. The first tip is going to be about balance within the section and why playing in a stand is not going to be good. In this first video, you're going to see the trumpet players playing into the stand, which is going to mitigate a little bit of sound reaching the audience. It also limits how much eye contact you can get when interacting in a jazz ensemble. In this second video, you're going to notice the trumpet players are going to be playing out of their stands and the sound is going to allow to, it's going to allow the sound to travel a little bit farther instead of it being in the sound bouncing back to them.
The next tip that I'm going to give you is going to be about balance within the trumpet section. And in this first piece, it's going to be about dancing nightly, composed and arranged by Bill Holman. In this video, you're going to hear what happens when the second, third, and fourth trumpet players don't play up to the lead trumpet players. It's going to not allow the lead trumpet player to play at their full volume or their full capabilities. In the second part of this video, you're going to hear the second, third, and fourth trumpet players playing up to the lead trumpet players and balancing out the sound of the section. It sounds much more pleasing to the audience and it's a lot easier on your lead trumpet player. The third and final tip today is going to be about the importance of articulation. The piece that we're going to use to demonstrate this is going to be St. Thomas, composed by Sonny Rollins and arranged by Bill Holman. In this section, you're going to hear the four different trumpet players playing different articulations in different styles. It's not going to allow any of the notes to line up and it's going to sound wrong. <laughs> In this second clip, you're going to hear the four trumpet players match all articulations and cutoffs. What this helps is the lining up of each cutoff and allowing each note to speak. The next section that I'm going to talk about um, is articulation and style. So when playing with a big band, something that I like to always remember um, is to always listen up to your lead players. So um, listen to lead trumpet um, to dictate um, style and articulation. That's really, really important when you're playing with an ensemble setting. So um, the first couple of articulations that I'm going to go over are just your basic um, three or four that you're going to see a ton. Um, and then I'll go into a couple of different things that you should know as a player in the section. Um, so the first one is staccato, um, just a little dot over your note. Um, it's really short, needs to be really short, dit, 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 dit. Um, not too heavy as well, um, but really short. And how I like to remember um, my different articulations, um, do, dat, dit. Those are the, the most common that you're going to see. So when I refer to those, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so here's the staccato. So just really short, um, probably even shorter than I was playing them. Um, so the second one is your tenuto marking, which is just a little slash over your note. Um, so you sustain the note for the full value, but there's no accent. There's no accent. So I refer to this one as do. Okay. Um, the next one is your short accent, which is. Um, looks like this. It looks like a little top hat on the top of your note. Um, so you should play the note for um, full value, but you should have a strong attack. So I like to remember this one as dat. So it should be just the fattest note that you can play. Okay. So the um, Next couple that I'm going to talk about are just a couple that you may run into. Um, so the first one um, we can talk about is the bend. So it looks like a little, almost like a little U over the top of your note. So um, what you're basically doing is you're using your embouchure to um, tempor temporarily um, do a dip in the pitch before the note. Okay, and I'll show you how that sounds. 
The last one we're going to talk about is um, plunger mute notation that you'll see um, on the charts that you're given. Um, so there's two um, options that you can see. You'll either see a T or an O. Um, the T means closed plunger, which means your plunger is over your bell, and O means open plunger. Um, this notation is really, really important under to understand when you're playing with a big band. So like if you're playing with a collection of notes, like two notes, and it has a T and an O, that means you're going to be playing boo -la. So closed, open, boo -la. Hi, my name is Cooper. I'm in the Jazz Ensemble trumpet section. I generally play lead parts or lower books if like we need a break because we switch around a lot. So I'm going to talk with you guys a little bit about the components of a trumpet warm-up and the importance of cooling down after a session. And you might have heard about warm-ups before, and some of this might be review, but one thing that's really important is that you also do at least one or two of these components at the end of every day so that your face stays nice and warm and like no matter what you're going to play next, you have a foundation to play on. The first thing about a trumpet warm-up is that there's usually one component that's on the horn and one component that's off the horn. So off the horn, I usually like to do some sort of like facial massage. So anything in here, up in here, and around my jaw, I like to get in and do just some quick... Just kind of massaging things out and getting any of that like bad lactic acid out of there. The next thing that I like to do is a little bit of breathing. One of the things that we take for granted as trumpet players is how little air it does take to play sometimes. And so we can get into a really bad habit of keeping our airstream and our lungs condensed. So doing some breathing exercises as we begin our day really starts to open ourselves up so that we're more efficient on the horn. All of those different variations of controlling your breathing are just good ways to get into the habit of being aware of what your body is doing while you're breathing. That way you're always taking in enough air and you're always using an efficient amount of air. Another thing that I like to do in the morning to open myself up is some chest stretches. So anything in here can get really tight over the night, especially if you're a side sleeper like me, because everything gets really condensed. And that really gets me kind of set for my day. All of those components are opening up my chest so that I can go in and play with a good airstream. So the next part of the warm-up that most people do is either some sort of mouthpiece buzzing or lead pipe buzzing. I personally don't like mouthpiece buzzing all that much because it's a different feel than when I'm playing my horn, and I don't find it all that beneficial for that purpose. But sometimes I will use it for ear training in the morning. I, I w do prefer doing things called lead pipe buzzing. So with that, I take out the tuning slide on my trumpet, and then I'll play... Um, just an open tone, whatever the open resting tone on that pipe is, because each pipe has a fundamental frequency. So I'll play whatever frequency is the most fundamental, and I'll try to create the most open trumpet sounding tone that I can with just the lead pipe. <laughs> try to do that the next partial up and then the next partial up and then I'll try and mimic that sound between the partials, doing some sort of scalar motion or some sort of arpeggio. Those become increasingly more difficult because the sounds don't slot in the slide. So you really have to be aware of the sound that you're trying to produce and to be able to replicate it. So now that I've finished off the horn, I go to my on the horn things. Now on the horn, there are a couple of categories that I want to hit every time I go through a warm-up. And those categories are going to be long tones, flexibility, articulation, fingers, and then whatever else I feel like I need to get myself ready for the day. So going in order, the first thing that I'll do, typically do is long tones. And so with long tones, I'll either put on what's called a cello drone or I'll put on a drone from the Tonal Energy Tuner app. Part of the reason why the Tonal Energy app is so cool and why it is well worth the like five or six bucks it is to spend on it is that you can get a tonal analysis during your warm-up every time you play so like even now as I just opened it it's analyzing the tone of my speech 
and telling me how sharp or flat I am, how much I'm within the tone, and how much the tone is wavering when I speak. And that's going to show me how much my tone is wavering while I'm playing, how much my tone is staying consistent, and if there's any sort of breaks in my tone while I'm doing long tones that are happening from breath, from air attacks, from any sort of external factors. And that's just a nice way to kind of evaluate at the very beginning of my on the horn warm up, what's going on today, what do I need to really hit. So once I'm done with the long tone portion of my warm up, I usually head into doing some flexibility stuff. And uh, the best book that I know for that is The Modern Flexibilities for Brass by Scott Belk. And this book, uh, he actually did one of the master classes that we have in the high school portion of the YouTube channel, and I highly recommend looking at that. He is such an amazing educator, and this just really makes lip slurs fun. <laughs> so flexibility is really just a fancy term for the name lip slur. One of the things that's really great about Scott Belk's Modern Flexibilities for Brass is that it has so many different types of flexibility exercises and so many different ways to do flexibility. Like, one of my favorite ones is called the Channel Cat because it really warms up my low register really well. It's fun to read, it's fun to play, and it's never something that feels like it's too rigid and structured. I highly, highly recommend getting this book, and I'll go ahead and play an excerpt from Channel Cat uh, after this so that you can hear what that sounds like. <laughs> Once I've finished with my long tones and my flexibility, I really want to warm up my tongue for the rest of the day because my tongue gets so tight and you can't like take your tongue out and massage it and stretch it like the rest of your face. So you really need to get an articulation portion of your warm up in to make sure that you're going to be successful the rest of the day. So usually I like to start with some sort of pattern. One that I really like is da 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 and then just going up and down a scale. It's just a really great way to quickly warm my tongue up without having to worry about taking up a huge amount of time, especially if I have a really short warm up session. But other things that I like to do is I like to go through a couple of the Chris Gecker studies in the Articulation Studies booklet. And even just in the first couple of pages, he has a couple of great uh, exercises that you can use. But the other stuff that he has are some great scalar exercises, which is a great way to work your scales in as well while doing single tonguing and multiple tonguing. So once I'm feeling warmed up in my face and in my tongue, the next really critical thing is to make sure that my fingers are warm because... Without our fingers and tongue working together, nothing is ever going to be clean. So a really great book that every trumpet player is going to suggest that you have is the Clark Technical Studies for Cornet. This book it should be in everybody's repertoire, and even if you only ever do one or two of the excerpts, those are going to be the best things that you can do for yourself finger technique-wise. Generally, I like to do my warm-ups starting with just the first excerpt. And I'll start in the middle, generally, and then work my way out to make sure that I'm clean in the more extreme registers because that's where the cleanliness really starts to get kind of woofy and muffly, whereas the middle register tends to be pretty clean. <laughs> Once I'm done with those key portions of my warm-up, I like to ask myself, how do I feel and what do I need? If I'm feeling like I want to spend some more time with my sound, I'll do some flow studies, like the stamp flow study. a Chikowitz flow study.
a flow study from the Chickowitz first volume for flow studies. Um, he also has a long tone studies book and all of his materials are amazing, and they come with a CD that you can play along with, so you can get a really good idea of the sound. Another thing that is really important is having a warm-up that you can do in five minutes or less. So having the really long warm-up is essential, and you need to have it as a part of your everyday routine, like during the summer or on the weekends when you have the time to spend doing that. But it's not culturally acceptable to wake up at 5 a.m. and play your trumpet in your house with your mom and your dad and all of your siblings and whoever else you may live with. It's not it's not okay to do that at 5 a.m. when the sun isn't even up yet and you don't have a practice room to go to either. So you need a five-minute warm-up that you can do before you go to your rehearsal at the beginning of the day. If you have jazz right off the bat, you don't want to go into that cold. You're going to hurt yourself. So having a five-minute warm-up that includes some soft playing, some long tones, some finger technique. I highly, highly recommend having a couple of those in your repertoire. That way you're not too worried about getting into things and not having <laughs> not having a warm-up right when you go into a rehearsal where you're having to play anything high, extended, loud. You don't want to hurt yourself because that can be really hard to come back from. Now the last piece of this segment that I'm going to talk about is a cool-down. The cooldown is probably the most important part of your playing at the end of each day because once you've gone through your rehearsal and you've played all the high stuff, you've played all the loud stuff, your face is starting to feel swollen, you really want to make sure that nothing is built up in there that's going to stay there overnight and make it worse to play in the morning. A couple of things to keep in mind with the cooldown is low and slow. You don't want to play anything fast, you don't want to play anything high, and you don't want to play anything loud because low will not only count for the range but it also counts for the volume. The louder you play, the less efficient it's going to be. Relaxation is another thing. If you're feeling really tight and really like, at the end of a session, it's really important to let all of that go. So relaxing, playing low and slow, and doing some of the exercises that we had talked about earlier with the mouthpiece buzzing, with the long tones, those are things that are going to help you cool down at the end of a session that will keep you feeling healthy and continue to help you going forward. As trumpet players, often at the end of a practice session, we feel like, oh no, I'm not going to be able to play tomorrow because my face just hurts so bad. Or at the end of a concert, we're like, you know what, tomorrow I need to take off, like, it hurts, I can't. And I hope that some of the tools in here help you have those moments less often. They do still happen even at the professional level where you just have a really inefficient day and things hurt and it, the next day is you have to take things easy. So take care of yourself use some of the things that we talked about today, some of the resources that we have. I hope you learned something, or at the very least have a new exercise to work on going forward. And thanks for joining us with the Buddy DeFranco Jazz Festival this year. Uh, it's, I hope to see you guys in person next year, and uh, yeah, have a good one.